Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this Tuesday's Lunch and Learn. I hope everybody had a great holiday weekend and had an opportunity to spend some time outdoors. It was such a lovely weekend for the most part. Um, today uh, for our Lunch and Learn, we have uh, De De oh, I'm sorry, Deputy Secretary John Norbeck and Secretary Cindy Dunn from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources here to talk to us today about the Keystone Fund and the Environmental Stewardship Fund. As always, if you have a question or comment, feel free to post it and I will relay that question to um, Secretary and the Deputy Secretary. So um, Secretary Dunn and John Norbeck, we we're going to talk about both the Keystone Fund and the Environmental Stewardship Fund. It might be helpful if uh, you could give us an overview. Let's start with the Keystone Fund. What is the Keystone Fund? How did it come to be and what does it do? How about, uh, Cindy Dunn here, how about if I take the uh, first part and then John talks about what it does for parks and forests. That would be great. Thank you. And I don't know if it speaks kind of to my age, but I was around during the campaign to get the Keystone Fund. Uh, it's called Key 93 because that's, in fact, uh, when, it was ha when it happened. It was during uh, the term of Governor Casey, and um, it was a... Uh, it was a well-organized campaign by a lot of the nonprofit yeah, conservation organizations who really saw the need for uh, park and forest infrastructure, also uh, libraries. Uh, the, the state library system was in that, and the state system of higher ed. So this, this coalition formed and uh, rallied around the need for a Keystone Fund built on the realty transfer tax. So the logic is that uh, a portion, a small portion, really transfer tax gets put into the Keystone Fund. DCNR receives the largest percentage of that, the 65%. And uh, once it comes to DCNR, by law, it's divided up between the grants program, uh, park and forest infrastructure, and land trust. So there's three divisions uh, spelled out um, by law. Within the state park and forest part, there can be a carve out for rivers and rail trails. The way we do it within the agency, we do take a uh, carve out for the uh, riparian buffers and rivers. It's, it's been around half a million. Uh, the rail trails we've been funding with the other funding we're talking about, ESF and also the Keystone Community Program. So. Um, with that, uh, it is, I will just say this before turning it over to John to talk about how we use it. It is, it is the uh, backbone of our ability to deliver public service in the form of the, uh, the land and the physical attributes on it, whether it's buildings, trails, or parks, if you see. It is uh, a central fund. Oh, and by the way, uh, because it did start with a bond initiative, it was put before the voters. And the voters endorsed the need um, enthusiastically uh, and support it. Had a lot of bipartisan support. And of course, uh, the governor Casey was sick at the time it was signed. And uh, Mark Single signed it uh, for the governor. So that's something he likes to talk about. So with that, I'll be quiet. And John will tell you what it was. Uh, so be before John begins, can, can we confirm? You said that you get 65%. But my understanding is that the, the uh, Realty transfer tax, 15% of the realty transfer tax comes back into the Keystone Fund, and then you get 65% of that 15%, correct? That's, that's correct, yes. Yeah, so the 15%, okay. yeah. So, like I said, it's only the Keystone Fund that's divided up is just a portion of realty transfer tax, but of that portion, DCNR uh, gets, is, is the biggest uh, participant, unlike BSF. Okay. And okay. So John, you know, I, I see Keystone Fund signs when I'm out about in state parks and state forests. I've also seen them in communities uh, on and on trails that I've been on. So can you tell us a little bit about how Keystone Fund money is used um, by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources? Absolutely. And uh, uh, thanks for having us on the, on the call today. Uh, I'll start off with the state and then I'll talk about um, how we use the money and I think that will support my statement in that I can't imagine what DCNR and uh, state parks and forests for sure and then our local parks would be without what they would be today without the Keystone Fund um, uh, supporting all the work that it does. Um, the secretary talked about land acquisitions and we certainly use 
Keystone funds to make uh, strategic land acquisitions in our state parks and our state forests. Um, also mentioned infrastructure and you know, the, the Bureau of State Parks and Bureau of Forestry has about a $4 billion infrastructure. So we have over 4,700 buildings, um, thousands of miles of roads, bridges, sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants. Um, many of the state parks uh, during the busiest, busiest times of the year, much like a little city. So they have all those amenities, if you will, that need to be taken care of. And we use the Keystone Fund to fix a lot of that stuff and actually build a lot of that stuff. Um, we also carve out a small portion of the Keystone Fund for each region and state parks and for the districts and, and forestry uh, to give to those managers and district foresters uh, uh, some money to make some smaller infrastructure fixes. You know, if they have a leaky roof, they can fix the roof at, so that it only costs us a couple thousand dollars instead of you know twenty thousand dollars to do a total replace if we waited too long. Um, we also use it for uh, uh, watershed restoration projects. Um, you know, we, uh, the secretary mentioned the riparian buffer program, but we also use it for restoration work. Uh, invasive species. Um, we have in the past uh, uh, used it for uh, particularly for uh, treatment for hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, we're starting to use it now for the spotted lanternfly. Uh, so it is, it is our go-to fund that allows us to be uh, agile to uh, deal with some of those um, invasives that uh, are very uh, detrimental to our, our public lands. We do trail work with it. Um, we also use Keystone to fund uh, a number of our wage employees in state parks. They have to work on a Keystone project, but that's pretty darn easy for them to do. So if they're working on replacing the roof uh, on a pavilion or something like that, or repairing a roof, uh, we can charge uh, their labor back to that Keystone fund and allows us to uh, uh, bring those additional wage employees on and also allows us to do a lot of work within the parks and forests. So when we're saying wage employee, do you um, mean a maintenance employee? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I remember being at a dedication last year, I believe it was last year, at the of a bathhouse at Colonel Denning State Park. So would that be the type of project that you're referencing when you're saying it, it is invested in, in some of some larger projects within a, a state park or a state forest? Yes. So... Um, I mean, a lot of folks think, and, and a number of state park systems actually just depend on their capital bond money that they get um, uh, every year, every couple of years. Uh, we certainly do get some capital money, but the size of the infrastructure and the state park system and forest system that we have, uh, that capital uh, budget could not uh, fix and repair uh, or replace those uh, facilities as needed. Uh, we also use that money to augment our capital program actually it's, it's you know sometimes you think of it the other way around but um you know where a capital project uh, uh comes in over budget uh which quite often they do by the time you know they're estimated uh when we put them into the capital budget and then by the time we get the funding for it it might be 10 years later so you have to adjust those uh costs for inflation and those types of things. And we generally use the Keystone Fund uh, to help us uh, meet those needs. So if, is it fair to say that um, from what I'm hearing that the Keystone Fund is, is pretty much the pot of money along with the Environmental Stewardship Fund that we'll talk about in a minute that is addressing the maintenance needs within our state parks and state forests? Yes, without a doubt. Uh, if we did not have that money, um, but we have very little general fund money that we use for daily maintenance. We just we just could not fix our infrastructure. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, Marcy, you know, you, your report identified a billion dollar need. I can't imagine what the number would be uh, without the Keystone Fund. And to be frank, I don't think we uh, would have 121 state parks without the Keystone Fund. I think the department would have had to over the years come to the sad conclusion that we can't operate 
a system without that fund. And uh, that's why every time uh, citizens defend this fund, it's really critical for the future of state parks and forests. Yes, I, I, I can see that. And I, I can see uh, someone picking up on just what the secretary said and said, well, well, maybe you can't afford the system that you have. But I think uh, probably most of the folks that are listening to this broadcast were probably out on their public lands sometime over the Memorial Day weekend and saw what great value the public land system brings to uh, the citizens of Pennsylvania and also to the economy of Pennsylvania, that uh, if we didn't have such a great system, uh, we wouldn't have those great values brought back to the citizens and, and back to the economy. Yeah, we're fortunate in Pennsylvania because there was the vision of having a state park and forest within 25 miles of every resident of the Commonwealth. So you can get to a park uh, or a forest very readily. There's no admission fee. There's no um, parking fee. So it's a way to be connected to healthy outdoor recreation, um, no matter what your budget is. And that, you know, you mentioned Pennsylvania is a leader in the nation. We rank fifth in the nation in terms of outdoor recreation spending, consumer spending, and it supports over 250,000 jobs outside of DCNR. So it really, when, when we're talking about investing in our parks and forests, for me, I really look at it as an investment because a little bit of money in is supporting a whole lot of other jobs and a lot of other people outside of the park or the forest. You're absolutely right, Marcy. The return on investment in these dollars is phenomenal. Uh, there's, yeah, our, our assessment of the state park system uh, it identified the return on investment. And the same is true with the community grants and the rail trails and all the other uh, parks and forests. The grants leverage uh, by law, at least a 100% uh, match. In other words, they match the same amount we give them, but most of them actually generate a lot more match. And then there's that value, as you say, to the economy that every single rail trail that's done a study, every uh, the Penn State study on state parks, which John can mention the numbers, but they're, it's phenomenal uh, what the return on investment to, to the taxpayer is for this investment from the Keystone Fund and Environmental Stewardship Fund. So it's absolutely worth the dollars in every way you would want to measure it. And of course, we're, we're motivated by the the public service it provides, what people really need, you know, close to home, accessible recreation, outdoor time, and the effect on mental health is becoming more and more clear. We know the effect on physical health, but the mental health connection is something that's becoming increasingly uh, studied and understood and when you think about the other crisis we have underway, the opioid crisis, when you think about our obesity crisis, it addresses a lot of uh, people's needs. I mean, a lot of medical needs that society has today. So there are four funds. Very true. You know, before we switch over to the Environmental Stewardship Fund, you know, you mentioned how important um, our parks are for our mental health. Are you seeing any increased visitation during this time of, of COVID-19? Absolutely. It's been phenomenal. And uh, thankfully, we're seeing um, people adhere to social distance in a way that we didn't see at the beginning of the crisis. We were very concerned. We still, we still remain vigilant and concerned, but people are, are understanding and getting the social distance, but nonetheless, the visitorship has been up in every phase of the COVID crisis. And it's clear that more than ever, people are flocking to the outdoors, um, you know, to spend time, to reduce stress, to get out of the house. Uh, the, the people are crowded under roof, and, you know, in a way they haven't been before. And this outlet is, is critically important for people. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Marcia, we did uh, mention the return on investment for the local communities from uh, the recreational use and, and certainly the health the health benefits. But there's also a, <laughs> a really great benefit that goes back to the communities through funding these programs or using the funding out of this program. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's the funding that uh, goes to local contractors. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It's not a COVID cough. It's a 
<laughs> Shoot. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so it brings a lot of money back into local communities through uh, all the local contractors that we hire. Yeah, so that's a very good point. I, I, I'll ask, um, Pam is in the background for folks who can't see her, but we, we were brainstorming a list of all the different potential job titles that were supported um, by the, the Keystone Fund. And, you know, maybe when Pam has an opportunity, she'll just run a ticker along the bottom. It was, it was pretty lengthy from surveyors to landscape architects to um, welders and pipe layers and, and plumbers and electricians and architects. And it was went on and on and on. Invasive species specialists. Um, a lot of different job titles supported by your investment in projects in state parks and state forests, as well as in community parks. It's a lot of jobs. I'll pick up on that strand that John brought up because um, when we do events, when we do finally do a ribbon cutting on, whether it's a new visitor center, a bridge, a tunnel, you name it, we invite uh, the local contractors. And you know, so we get to meet these people and they uh, they tell us about how important that, that work was for their their business and uh, more than more than say uh, other construction projects you know picture of big big pendot projects or something more than those type of projects our projects tend to go to small local businesses they can win the bid in these rural communities because of proximity and because of pricing and the size of the job so we see uh, a lot of family businesses a lot of, you know I, I remember meeting the father the mother and the son at the uh, solar array groundbreaking out at, I mean, uh, ribbon cutting out at Moraine. All three of the family members drove across the state for that because that was a big deal to their family business. Excellent, excellent. The, running along the bottom now, you, for, uh, you can see it at um, hopefully secretary and deputy secretary. That was just our little brainstorming session of some of the various um, types of positions that are supported through investments into the Keystone Fund. It's a lot of different types of occupations. Absolutely. Yep. yep. The Keystone Fund, just to bring it into perspective a little bit, <clears throat> um, this past uh, fiscal year, uh, 1920, um, just in park and forest infrastructure alone, it was about 24, uh, almost $25 million that went back into uh, some of our wage staff. Certainly it's a smaller amount, but a vast majority of that money goes actually goes back into uh, land acquisition uh, as a smaller portion, but but the greatest portion goes back into our infrastructure and fixing the stuff that we currently have. So you know, let's put that into perspective. What's what is the in in relation to the budget for the the states? What is DCNR's budget in relation to in relationship to that? So if it's just to give people, because you know, when you hear twenty-five million, for some people, they think well, that's a lot of money. But mm -hmm. in, in, on the grand scale of things, where does that fall? John, do you remember what percent of a penny our budget is? I think it's like a third of a percent of a penny. Uh, but I, w I will say, when you when you hear twenty-five million, it is a lot. But when you think about four billion dollar infrastructure, it's not very much. Um, you know, if you depreciate. Uh, properties at 4%, uh, you need a whole lot more than $25 million to uh, keep that that property up to, up to snuff. So right. It's certainly right. very helpful to us, but it's also, you know, when you look at that larger $4 billion figure, um, you, you understand very quickly why we're behind in our infrastructure needs. You know, we have a billion dollars worth of infrastructure needs. And that Correct. includes those types of things. So. But I think it's about a third of a penny to get back to your original question. Yeah. So if, if the state budget were represented by a dollar, your budget would be one third of a penny in relationship to that dollar. So that that puts it into perspective for people, you know. And we were talking a little while ago about the 121 parks and and the uh, the state forest, you know. And um, I think every person has an affinity to a particular place in that park and forest system. And that might be the closest park or forest to someone. So if if money were not around to make a park or forest safe and it would have to be closed for a period of time, that would have a direct impact, not just on on the people, but on the local communities that are near that park or forest. Is that a, a correct assumption? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I can painfully uh, pull out from the past. Uh, we closed a, a campground down in uh, Pimatuming uh, back during uh, the very end of the Rendell administration because of the budget shortfalls that, that uh, were occurring. Um, that community, um, their business has struggled and they're still struggling uh, with that cap campground being closed. Uh, so it, it, it does, it feeds right back into the community. You know, we heard um, from a lot of businesses, uh, particularly in the rural areas uh, at, during that time period, the value that uh, having the state park or the state forest near them allows them to keep their stores open year round and that uh, they make a large portion of their uh, annual income during the busier seasons in the Parker Forest. And if they weren't there, they would not be able to run a store that serves those communities. And a lot of these are very rural communities. So if that store were to disappear, that would have a very negative impact on people that residing in that community. Yes, yes. So we've been talking about the Keystone Fund, and we can come back to that. But um, let's talk a little bit about the Environmental Stewardship Fund. That's the other one that we hear about and that um, plays a very important role in um, maintaining our state parks and state forests. So could the, you talk a little bit about what that fund is and um, what that means to our state parks and state forests? I'll, I'll jump in with a little history again. Uh, these uh, came out of uh, the Ridge Era Grow and Greener One and the Rendell Era Grow and Greener Two. Environmental Stewardship Fund comes from a landfill tipping fee. And uh, so again, it's not uh, general tax revenue, but it's, um, in, with this one, we get about 24%. I think we're a little south of 24% right now, but it, DEP uh, gets uh, the, the larger share of this one. There, theirs is in the 32%. So a good bit of Environmental Stewardship Fund, if you look at DCNR and DEP combined goes for uh, environmental purposes. Uh, a portion also goes to PennVest. And if I, yeah, I'm doing this from memory, uh, so I hope I'm correct, but a portion goes to the Farmland Preservation Program and the Department of Agriculture. So again, it's a, an array of environmental programs. Um, ESF funding is among the, is about the most flexible funding we have. So we can use it for partnership grants like uh, PPFF and the, you know, the Land Trust Alliance and Recreation and Park Society. And these partnerships are critical uh, in, in our ability to deliver public service in the manner that people are accustomed to in Pennsylvania. If you look at DCNR's formation 25 years ago, in July, of this, year, this, this July will be our 25th anniversary, um, the agency was conceived as a uh, partnership organization. It was understood that um, DCNR would, would rely on partnership to deliver uh, recreation and conservation and all the benefits that go with it to the public. So these partnerships were envisioned in the formation of DCNR, but the Environmental Stewardship Fund is really what's needed to allow that uh, because without the support, we really couldn't garner and uh, do everything we're able to do together for the citizens of Pennsylvania. But it's also a fund that we can use for the Keystone purposes. Uh, it can go to state park and state forest infrastructure. It can go to land conservation. Uh, it's a little more restrictive there. Uh, some of the more conservative members of the Senate required that it be uh, contiguous land and be bordering state lands, but nonetheless, it can go to add land to the state park forest system. And it can uh, it can be used for community grants. And in that realm, in the community side, uh, it's the only fund that we can easily do, that we can do for a nonprofit uh, recreation provider. Some communities, the government uh, really doesn't provide for, um, you know, for the recreation attribute. And we can't really get to the through Keystone Fund. So this uh, allows us to fill in some gaps in the community recreation side. But John, John, if you could talk about how it's used in park and forest infrastructure towards um, chipping away at that, uh, that ongoing need. Sure. Um, uh, I will say that we use the Environmental Stewardship Fund very similar to Keystone and 
I think the, the main difference you'll see is that, uh, so we can use ESF for land acquisition. We can also use it for infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, um, uh, the the definition that, that is used is, is the built infrastructure, but also our uh, green infrastructure, if you will. So we use ESF more towards, um, I talked earlier about Keystone money. So we use that for invasive species, but we use the, the environmental stewardship fund mostly for those uh, natural resource based uh, infrastructure projects, if you will. Uh, so we've used it in the past um, for uh, uh, dealing with gypsy moth and we've used it for, uh, again, Hemlock Willie Delgid, um, uh, Spotted Lander Fly, um uh we're using for our, our aquatics program uh, um, and this is more in state parks so that we have done some aquatics work in, in the bureau of forestry where you know we have invasive species in in, in our lakes and, and uh, ponds also so we're doing some treatment there uh probably the biggest project that we've had on going for about a decade now is that at Pimatumi. um uh, just working with aquatic invasive vegetation uh, that, that is choking uh, that lake uh, and some portions of it. So uh, we use it um, um, to keep our places open and um, keep it uh, cleared out for uh, our visitors that are, that are coming to boat and, and that type of thing. So, like right now, I I, uh, I recall that Whipple Dam has some some work being done. You know, the the lake was lowered and taking out the silt and some of the the aquatics. Would that be ESF money or Keystone Fund money for something like that? If that's a great question. I, I'm not sure on that specific project, but we could use ESF or Keystone for that project itself. More than likely, that's Keystone. Uh, ESF has been. Uh, we use that more towards the green side of our work, though we can use it for built infrastructure too. So when we're talking green side, in addition to some of those those invasives that you talked about, um, would this, I remember when we were working on the infrastructure report, there's almost um, a $300 million need for um, abandoned mine drainage remediation for those streams that are no longer living or for um capping wells in where there you know was um, shallow gas wells would that type of funding be used for those types of projects yes and actually uh we're currently doing some uh, uh orphaned wells uh, uh, working with the dp so we're plugging some orphan wells uh, in the corn planter uh, forest district you know we've done some of the sprow we um have worked with um uh, DEP uh, using some of their funding, but also using some of our funding for ESF to do those um, abandoned mine reclamation properties, just as you mentioned, uh, try to clean up our waterways and our state forest lands. So a lot of diverse projects that are that are supported by the Environmental Stewardship Fund. Yes. You know, one of the things that we hear, because as you know, we we feel these funds are very important to protect because of the of what they do for our built and natural environment. Um, one of the things that we hear is there's all this money just languishing in a pot somewhere. Can, can you can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I, I, was ready, I was ready to click hang up to get on my call, but I, I got to <laughs> galvanize me to be a little late for my next call. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been very frustrating for us on the agency side. If you can picture, picture the best way to describe it is picture your own uh, management of your own finances if you're very planful. And you know uh, you need a new roof in two years, and you know you need a, uh, you, need, you, know you need a, a roof, you, need, you know you need a project that'll take a couple years to pay for. We have all the money laid out in projects all the funds are identified for a project. Sometimes it's a project that'll take two or three years to spend down. Sometimes it's a project that's awaiting a permit decision or awaiting a green light or awaiting uh, matching funds, but it's all been identified to the intended use of the Keystone Fund or the Environmental Stewardship Fund. Yet uh, in the bank account, which is SAP, the SAP system, uh, you can see the money because it's, it takes a couple of years to spend it down. 
and uh, it's uh, legislators are capitalizing on the fact that you can see it to say that therefore it's not needed because there it is. Um, and every every dollar that's cut from that will, will mean a project gets put aside or delayed. And it's been very frustrating to communicate about this because, um, yes, you can see the money, but this does not mean it's available to be cut or used from some other purpose. But John, anyway, I, I will have to go. But John can speak to uh, how that uh, how that looks uh, in his world when you have a project that's all ready to go and, and figured out and the money gets moved away. Well, and I will speak to from like if, if it's a community grant program, some of these grants are reimbursement grants for a portion of it. So a community may be working on a project and, you know, that money is being held for once the project is completed so they can be reimbursed for the, the money that they, they spent on maybe creating a new park or um, putting in a trail. Absolutely. And these are matching funds. So the community has done its share. It's, it's out there. And just imagine getting uh, getting their matching funds lined up in, a, in say, a township. I mean, there's just multiple public meetings. They've identified where the money is coming from for their match. In some cases, the project's underway, and they just need the final phase of the project, and they have their money. So, yes, all those things are true on the community side. Uh, so uh, we, we continue to try to educate legislators on this. Uh, but this attack on those funds comes in, in various shapes uh, over the over the years. Um, I will say, I mean, there, there's with the COVID crisis, um, the budget gap in state government is is going to be deep. And I, I made a little pitch in my uh, side notes here. Obviously, we need the federal uh, funds to fill in the gaps in state revenue. Uh, every state needs them. So there, there are uh, some, some serious concerns about all funds, not just Keystone and Environmental Storage Fund, in the face of uh, declining state revenues. So I think that uh, all funds, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just would uh, really would hope that the legislature understands the value of these funds. Uh, and if, if, there's, if all funds take a haircut, uh, hopefully it's a minor haircut, but uh, it shouldn't be bigger than other funds uh, need to take. Just a, just a little pitch there. There's a lot of valuable funds in state government. Yes, yes. And then one, one of the things that we've been saying is that, you know, this is really, this is, these are jobs. These funds support jobs, you know, at, at a time when we, we, we need to be investing in jobs. Um, if we can support them through the natural infrastructure and the built infrastructure of our parks and forests and our community parks, um, it's a win-win because not only are we supporting jobs, but we're also supporting people's access to healthy outdoor recreation to reduce their stress and to improve their health. And as we knew during this whole COVID-19 is, is that the better your base health is, the less susceptible you were to um, COVID or it didn't have as severe of an impact. So um, being healthy benefits everybody, not just the person who's healthy. It benefits the employer who's employing somebody. It, it benefits us, you know, in so many different ways. That's very true. And with that, I'll, I'll sign off and Don will uh, still be on. All right. Well, thank okay. you, Secretary Don. We appreciate you uh, carving out some time to be with us today. Uh, we know that your schedule is very busy, but this is a very important sub subject. So we're glad that you were able to join us. Well, thank you. And uh, we really appreciate your support. A very important conversation from our end as well. And thank you for all the ongoing support uh, in so many ways, from the face mask to uh, the funding. You're, you're always welcome. Happy to help. So, John, what happens if, if money is deferred? You know, the secretary mentioned that perhaps um, money would be there and then it was deferred. And all of a sudden, you know, you thought you were doing a project and you aren't able to do it. What happens? What's that look like? Yes, if, if, if I could just step back a minute and, and, and I'll, I'll answer that here in, uh, in just a second. Um, but there's several different ways that you can and manage your money, if you will. And that's what we're doing. We're actually managing uh, the citizens of Pennsylvania's money. Um, and you can draw a correlation between how you manage your money at home. So uh, one school of thought would be um, is you buy what you need right now and then you pay over time, uh, much like a mortgage or a credit card okay. uh, based on the fact that you hope that you, you you know you're you're employed and you have income coming in and you'll be able to pay those bills as they as they come up 
And then there's another school of thought, and this is how we've been operating in, in uh, DCNR for some time now, is that we don't spend the money until we get it in our hand, if you will. So, uh, you know, if we get, uh, like I said, $24 million in Keystone Fund or $10 million in ESF this fiscal year, then we will plan projects for that money so that we know that when we make a commitment to do a design, uh, do a scope of work, do permitting processes, all that kind of stuff, that we'll be able to follow through with that because, uh, in theory, the money is in the bank. Um, and that's exactly what we've done. So why does it take so long? So uh, if you look at some of these projects, uh, you know, DCNR has reduced its staff considerably over the last uh, uh, decade and a half. Um, so we do a lot of contract work and we contract uh, folks to do a lot of our design work now. Um, so say you get the money on July 1st and it probably takes a month before you see actually how much it is and uh you're approved to spend out of that so you're into august um those high priority projects will be queued up and they'll be sent to a designer a design firm um and depending on the project most of them take about a year to a year and a half uh because a lot of that includes the permitting process so you mm -hmm. want to be yeah. able to go through at least one full cycle you know so you, that you're uh your uh, contractor can go out along with staff at times and make sure that we're not doing work in wetlands and uh, looking at endangered species, those types of things. So it, it takes at least 18 months to get your design uh, project back. Uh, so that might take you almost one, at least one year, if not two fiscal years out from when you first got the money. Then you put it out to bid. You have several months there. Um, and uh, you get those bids back in, you do the analysis, you award the job. So that's probably another three or four months uh, involved there. So it could, it could easily get you three fiscal years out before you actually spend that money. Uh, however, uh, again, the way we've been operating, we were assured that money was there, uh, that we weren't going to be wasting money on designing projects when we didn't have the money to, to actually complete the project. So um, we think it's a pretty prudent way to operate. I think that uh, during this uh, uh, COVID process that we're going through now, um, I felt pretty good in that even though the economy slowed down considerably, the projects that we had queued up um, and in design, we were gonna be able to do because we had the money in the bank, so to speak. Uh, and we looked at that from a couple of different angles. One, we wanted to get those, that work done on our critical infrastructure. But at the same time, as uh, soon as things uh, turned yellow for uh, the construction trade in particular, we could get a lot of folks right back to work um, as long as they had an approved um, COVID safety plan. But we And, and they all did. We, our contractors came up with some really good stuff uh, so that they're working uh, safely on our projects. But the point there is we could get our projects done. We could get folks back to work because we already, because of the way we were spending money, we already had the money in the bank. You know, right. if, we, if we were waiting on or depending upon um, uh, real estate tax or uh, transfer uh, fees coming in, uh, I think, I think we would have probably been canceling a number of projects because the money was not going to be there. So while the money might be, be, appear to be there it is you're saying it, it is um, connected to something connected to a project and by having that money you're able to plan ahead so that allows you to look ahead and, and identify the projects that need to be addressed and plan for them in a, in a meaningful way yes and, and again there's no there's no uh, wasted uh, design money there um, you know as seeing where the funds come from. So our, our Keystone Fund is real estate transfer tax. ESF is, is basically tipping fees. You know, those funds, they they fluctuate and they fluctuate a lot with uh, the economy. Um, so you might be, if you, if you were uh, looking forward on a particular amount of income coming into those funds for the next fiscal year, and there's a slight downturn in the economy, 
Uh, you may waste some money on designing projects that you won't be able to get to because there's not enough money there. Correct. So the way we're, so the way we're doing it, if we're designing something, uh, in, unless there's a legislative move to take money away from us, um, we're you know we're good to go. We're not going to waste any money. Um, you know, frankly, in, in this uh, uh, this most recent legislative session, there are some bills that uh, looked at. Uh, realigning how those funds would be appropriated um, that may or may not have re resulted in uh, wasted design uh, or slowing down the process and not getting projects done or in worst case scenario not getting money at all to do those types of projects yeah that's you know we as the pennsylvania parks and forest foundation we have opposed those bills um you know we we if folks are watching this and they're interested in learning a little bit more about those, they can go to the news section of our website where there's there's more detail as to why we oppose them. Um, and John has spoken to that, um, which is the fact that this money is indeed committed and doing very good work on the ground and supporting a lot of jobs across the Commonwealth. And John, you mentioned the permitting process, and I can so relate to that because you know every couple of months I call you and I say, hey, we're, we have this bridge we want to put in at the Gallitzin State Forest. Where are we on the permit? So we know personally as, as the foundation, no matter where the funding is coming from, there is a process that has to go through. And we, we've been sitting on some money for a year and a half waiting for the permit to, to be issued um, so that we could place that bridge. So. And, and, and that will, money is earmarked. We have it. You know, that's not just sitting there on, you know, it has a specific purpose Yeah. when we get the go ahead. Uh, and, and some folks rail, and I'm probably one of them, about uh, how long it takes projects uh, to go through that permitting process. Uh, and we are working with DEP to streamline the administrative side. So, there, I mean, there's two sides of that permitting process. Uh, one is administrative, which we have we and i said that in a collectively large group as a commonwealth you know we have a lot of authority over uh, that process we can shorten that up and we're working with the ep to do that you know the natural process is a natural process so right uh, you know if, if you're looking if you're looking for uh, uh wetland indicator species uh you're not going to do that in january right so if you start a, if, if you have a design a project design um, and it's late fall, you're going to have to go through a cycle, um, uh, a, a natural cycle that you can't speed up. I mean, Mother Nature's speeding it up a little bit with uh, climate change. Um, but my point is uh, we have to wait and make sure that we're uh, doing things appropriately. So some of that time is out of our control. Um, Absolutely. But frankly, that's okay. That's right. We want to do the right thing. So. No, no. You know, as, as uh, you are the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, so you do indeed need to take all those things into consideration. And, and we applaud you for doing that because it's uh, those are all important players in this place we call Earth. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm checking to see um, if we have, um, there's, um, Pam just put up our news page where you can learn a little bit more about some of the bills that have been introduced that could negatively impact um, the Keystone Fund and the Environmental Stewardship Fund. The foundation has always taken the stance that it's important to protect these because they're critical, um, not just for our state park and state forest maintenance and infrastructure needs, but for communities as well. And as we talked you know, with the secretary and the deputy secretary, these funds also support jobs in local communities and the fact that people are have access to parks and forests that does um, improve quality of life. Um, it does help drive the economy of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're the fifth in the nation in terms of consumer spending on outdoor recreation. We have a new website up called Protect Our Parks and Forests that delves deeper into the billion dollar need for maintenance and infrastructure that uh, John referred to. Um, as John said, it's a $4 billion uh, infrastructure system in parks and forests. And if you look at other agencies, that's a lot of infrastructure, but it's supporting a lot of really good things. And it is what we as Pennsylvanians, because we've had a park and forest system for 127 years, it's really what we uh, often uh, describe as our legacy. Um, and we, there's a very, we identify ourselves with, with our favorite, state park and our favorite state forest. And, um, you know, 
we mentioned a little bit earlier, John, you know, what, what, what is the visitation up? Do you have a, have a feel for how much, you know, during the COVID, how much visitation to our public lands has increased? I know it's hard in, in forests to count people, but in our state parks, what type of increased visitation are you seeing? Yeah, so um, during March, our visitation was up. Um, in some parks, it was 100%. Um, but overall, I, I think the number uh, was about a half a million more visitors in March this year than we had um, the previous year. Uh, that's probably like a 20 some percent increase. Uh, in April, uh, our visitation was up uh, uh, again, statewide, about 14%, but that's with all of our overnight facilities being closed during the month of April. So last year's, last year's numbers included all our campgrounds and and uh, cabins, those types of things that generally get really good visitation, particularly at the end of, the, end of April because of uh, trout season. Uh, so those places right. were closed, yet our visitation numbers were still 14% uh, over what they were uh, last year. And there was also no school programming or family programming or anything happening during the month of April. So that is a significant increase. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll continue to see people, you know, embracing their, their state parks and state forest um, and what we call staycations, you know, visiting those places close to home for our, our recreational needs and our vacations. Yeah, we saw that during the, uh, the Great Recession where our visitation went from about in state parks um, for a decade or so, it fluctuated in between 30 and 35 million visitors uh, visits annually up to around 40 million visits. Um, and after you know, the recession uh, was over and the economy was rolling again, uh, our visitation is still in the 39 to 40 million visits a year. Because uh, that's folks came out, you know, it's, it's folks that used to go to parks and forests that for whatever reason in their life, um, uh, slipped away from that, they came back, they saw how much they were missing and they stayed, you know, they keep coming back. And of course, we got a bunch of new folks coming out to their state parks and state forests uh, for the first time and really seeing what, they, what they've been missing. Uh, and then they continue to come back. So we think that that trend is going to uh, uh, repeat itself uh, because of uh, COVID-19. Um, so we expect to get well over uh, 40 million visits uh, this year, probably next year, and maybe the year after that. Um, our biggest concern is, that, you know, can we handle that? Uh, can our infrastructure handle that? Um, you talk about a, a state park within 25 miles of uh, every citizen, and we're pretty much there in Pennsylvania. Um, but some of the places in the eastern part of the state in particular um, get a lot of use. I mean, that's where a lot of, a lot of our population lives. Uh, and and we, we see some overuse there, which tells me that we probably need more public lands in that eastern section of the, of the uh, Commonwealth. Absolutely. People are looking for the opportunity and, and maybe there's, there's not enough there. Great. Um, well, John, I really appreciate that both you and, and the secretary were able to join us today to talk about the Keystone Fund and the Environmental Stewardship Fund. And just to give um, us a broader picture of, of our parks and forests and the needs and and the, um, the the love that people have for them. We, as always, we really appreciate your time. I also really appreciate all the good work that the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources does for our public lands and for the leadership that you've shown during the, the, the pandemic and keeping people safe. So thank you very much from the, the foundation and from myself for that work. Yeah, we'd like to thank you also, Marcy, for your leadership with PPFF and all your volunteers. Um, you know, a lot of the great stuff that, that we can do in DCNR is because of the volunteerism and the dedication of the people that uh, you work with through your friends group. So thank you done a great job. You're welcome. You're welcome. They, uh, the friends are very happy to, to, to be of service as are we. And this is this, we are celebrating Pennsylvania state park and state forest week. It goes from the 23rd of May to the 30th. Um, you can learn more about that on our websites, but you know, um, we do need to go. I'm going to be talking to the Pennsylvania outdoor Corps here in a, in a few minutes, John. So right. that was a, 
Uh, maybe uh, another time we can do a program on that because that's a, that's a great program out of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources that's really helping to employ young people and connecting them to the conservation and stewardship of our public lands. We also use some ESF and Keystone money to help support that program also. Well, that's good to know. That's yeah. very good to know because uh, that's a, it's a good program and we want to see it continue. Yes. So thank, thank you so much. I hope you have an enjoyable day. I, I was actually camping at Fowler's Hollow last night, so I will be going back down there. Um, but it was lovely to, to be back out into the parks and forests. Great. All Thanks right. a lot, Marcy. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.